Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Shumacast. I am Noel, being joined, as always, by Angie. Hello, everyone. And we have a very special guest joining us today, a returning guest. I believe this is your third time on this show, J.D. DeMott. One thing about podcasting I can never stomach, all the damn vampires. I know, right? (laughs) Wait till mom finds out. So yes, JD, you were with us on Car Wash, on DC Cab. Do you want to just give mm-hmm. everyone a quick reminder where they can find your stuff? Best place to find me is at JD Demott on Twitter. You can find all the other stuff from there. Okay. We are here to discuss the 1987 vampire teen classic, The Lost Boys. Yes. Angie, is this a film you had ever seen before? At least twice. <laughs> I think I first saw it... It's really been bugging me. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but I'm pretty sure that it was post Bill and Ted obsession. Of course. It was like, oh, something else Alex Winter's in. I've got to check this out. And of course, he like barely speaks in the whole movie. (laughs) And gets a wonderful death. Yeah. (laughs) Right, right. But I've always been a fan of vampires, so Mm -hmm. that at least kept me going through it. But yeah, I remember enjoying it at the time, not necessarily falling in love with it, but enjoying it. Kitty? I'm pretty sure I saw it probably as edited for basic TV Mm. probably 20 years ago or something. I mean, it's been a long time. To be honest, watching this film, I'm like, I thought that the Corys were actual brothers in this film (laughs) and not so much. I had forgotten so much about this film. It's basically like watching it for the first time again. And I had watched it for the first time in this. This is one of those films I'd always kind of known about. I don't know why I never saw it. I think it was one of those ones I always wanted to read first because, you know, I'm one of those people who, like, if there's a book or if I have the script, I want to read it and then watch it because I like the screenwriter. There's a famous novelization that I always try to get my hands on to read before I watched it, but I just kept waiting. And we finally got to this project and it's like, well, yeah, finally got to see it. (laughs) And Angie, you know, our last episode that we did, Slow Burn with Melissa Mm Kirscher, literally the evening after we recorded that podcast, she and I sat down for a triple feature where for the the first time she showed me Near Dark, Lost Boys, and What We Do in the Shadows. Okay, nice little vampire. That's a yeah. good trilogy. Yeah, especially Near Dark because that came out the same year as Lost Boys. It was fascinating seeing how there's a lot of similar parallels, but they both do wildly different things with it. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, What We Do in the Shadows is just wonderful and funny. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, yes. But yeah, so that was last month. So that was the first time I had ever seen Lost Boys, which is fascinating because when we started the Joel Schumacher project, there's so many people who are like, oh, isn't he the Batman guy? But he also did Lost Boys. Mm-hmm. So it's like Lost Boys and the Batman Batman movies are like the two major associations that people seem to have with Joel. Yes, I would Mm -hmm. agree. So it's finally relieving to get to that, to actually get to see it for myself. Yes. So the film was released in July of 1987 and was again directed by Joel Schumacher. Now, the film was initially written by Jan Fisher and James Jeremias. Jeremias has no other credits, but Fisher only wrote a few episodes of TV shows like Tough Cookie and Golden Girls. And while much of their underlying story is still intact, there's a lot of major details that were significantly changed by the end point. But we'll bring that up later on because I think there's going to be some interesting discussions to be had on that. Mm. The first director attached to the project was Richard Donner, who intended it to be his follow-up to Lady Hawk and Goonies. But then the project ended up stalling for a year, so he left to direct Lethal Weapon. However, he still stayed attached to this project as producer. We talked about his wife, Laura Schuler, later Laura Schuler Donner, who was Mm -hmm. Joel's producer on Amateur and Dixie Bar and Grill and his previous film, St. Elmo's Fire. Right. Donner is also the one who first brought in Jeffrey Bohm to rewrite the script. 
Bohm first started as a studio executive in the 70s, but then gradually shifted into becoming a prominent screenwriter in the 80s with films like Straight Time, The Dead Zone, Inner Space, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Lethal Weapons 2 and 3, and The Phantom, as well as the TV series The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr., which he created. Sadly, he passed away in 2000 at just the age of 53 of a sudden heart attack. Mm. So big Hollywood screenwriter, but sadly taken from us too soon. Yeah, that's sad. And then after Donner left the director's chair, the first director that they brought in to replace him was a very prominent music video director named Mary Lambert. Okay. And this was set to be her feature film debut, but she had never done a feature before. And there were some ultimate clashes and she parted with the project after only a couple of months. Mm. Her actual debut film, Siesta, came out the same year as Lost Boys, 1987. And then she followed that up with Pet Cemetery. Right. And has since gone on to have a rather mixed horror career and still <laughs> continues doing music videos. It, after she left, that Joel became involved. He had a lot of changes he wanted to make, but he still kept Jeffrey Baum on board as screenwriter, and they made those changes together. What's interesting is that this is now starting the trend. We've had so many films that we've covered that are basically Joel Schumacher creations. He did the script. They are his characters, his world, and all that stuff. But we're starting to now hit the area where Joel is not going to be writing the films anymore. And it's more he's a director who's being offered films by studios and him just picking projects that gravitate towards him that he feels a click with or he feels this will be an interesting challenge to do. So it's going to be interesting now hitting into this new era where it's other people's creations that Joel is now coming on board to see what he can do with. Mm -hmm. And we kind of saw that mm -hmm. with Incredible Shrinking Woman, which he came in and directed as a favor after the initial director left. I mean, we'll get into it more in the discussion. I think his influence is definitely still there mm -hmm. in this film. So it'll be interesting, I guess, to see if we can still see that going forward. I think we all know we'll be able to see it in the Batman film. So. Right. <laughs> it'll be interesting because I know there have actually been writers that he's had clashes with because of changes that he wants to make to script. So he is someone who definitely picks up something and he tries to figure out how can I make this mine. Right. So it'll be interesting to see, like, where does that gel? Where does that clash? Mm-hmm. I did just want to mention one other name just as a frequent collaborator of Joel's. This is the first Joel Schumacher film edited by Robert Brown, but then he will go on for the next five films and do Cousins, Flatliners, Dying Young, and The Client. Okay. So otherwise, I don't have anything else for the production notes, though I did just want to mention one thing that we are not going to be covering on this episode is the novelization of the film by Craig Shaw Gardner. And that is because I am going to be guesting on the podcast series I Read Movies, hosted by Paxton Hawley, where we are going to discuss the novelization and compare it to the film, see what bits the author added, what differences there are. Definitely check out the show notes to this episode. I will link to that episode. Also go check out I Read Movies. It's a really fun podcast series and I highly recommend it. So, Angie, I'll toss it to you for the synopsis. All right. Recent divorcee Lucy moves to Santa Carla to live with her father along with her two teenage sons, Sam and Michael. Grandpa is a strange guy who loves taxidermy a little too much, but is otherwise a good guy. Santa Carla appears to be a popular seaside town with a boardwalk, but also has a bit of a biker punk and murder problem. When a beautiful girl named Star catches Michael's eye, she leads him directly into the biker gang's clutches. After messing with him a bit, they invite him to share a bottle of wine with them. Suddenly, he's able to fly and doesn't like hanging out in the sun too much. Wandering around the boardwalk, Sam finds a comic shop and quickly goes out of his way to prove his nerd cred, but the Frog Brothers, Edgar and Alan, are only concerned with one thing, vampires. They warn Sam that the town is swarming with them, and if he ever finds himself in trouble, he should give them a call. Meanwhile, Lucy gets a job at a video store and is quickly charmed by its owner, Max. Michael is slowly but surely turning into a vampire and almost tries to eat Sam before being stopped by their dog, Nanook. Michael tries to get some help from Star, but just ends up sleeping with her instead. Sam turns to the Frog Brothers, who at first insist that Max must be the head vampire. When Lucy invites him over for dinner, the young boys try to catch him with garlic, holy water, and mirrors, but he appears to be quite normal. The vampires, led by the charismatic David, leave Michael out to a bonfire party and insist that he must feed with them in order to make his transformation complete. He stands by in horror as they slaughter the group. He then turns to Sam and the Frog Brothers for help and leads them to the vampire lair. They rescue Star and young boy Laddie, but only manage to kill the lackey Marco in a messy spray of blood before just barely escaping with their lives. With Lucy out on a date with Max and Grandpa sent out of the house, the boys plan their big showdown with the vampires. Their bathtub full of holy water kills one in an even more glorious spray of blood, 
And Sam manages to kill another by staking him with a bow and arrow and electrocuting him for good measure via the stereo. Michael is gaining more vampire traits by the second, and so he and David have a big showdown flying through the air until Michael spears David on the horns of one of the many creatures Grandpa is working on in his workshop. But something is wrong, because even though David is dead, Michael isn't returning to normal. Lucy and Max show up at the house, and it turns out Max really was the head vampire after all. He wasn't hurt last time because they invited him in. His plan was to turn Michael and then Sam, therefore making Lucy want to join too, because his boys need a mother figure. He grabs Sam, and Lucy is ready to begrudgingly go along with it to save her boys, when suddenly Grandpa comes home and bashes his jeep straight through the front of his own home, staking Max and saving the day. The end. (laughs) It literally does just cut to black, yeah. (laughs) It really, I mean, like, you know, he makes the comment about the vampires, and then that's it. There's no wrap-up whatsoever. (laughs) It's like, Grandpa knew about them all along. (laughs) Ha ha, that's it. So Angie, do you recommend The Lost Boys? Yes, it's flawed. It kind of makes me think of movies like The Goonies, where if you've watched them as a kid, you're probably already in love with it, and I don't have to recommend it to you. If you watch it as an adult who kind of missed out on it for whatever reason, it may or may not impress you as much. There's definitely some flaws there. Direction choices, I don't think Michael is a good lead at all. (laughs) But there's also a lot of things it gets right. I think some of the dialogue is really snappy and fun. All of the kids are really entertaining and Kiefer Sutherland is great as David. It's one of those things where you kind of have to overlook some of the things that go wrong, but the things that go right, I think, go really right. JD? Kind of similar to Angie. It's one of those things where there's a lot of problems with it. There's some beautiful cinematography. The imagery is very striking. I actually preferred a lot of the teenager actors, for the most Mm. part, over the kids. I think the kids felt a little too much like kids, to be honest. (laughs) I don't think Corey Haim is a really strong actor. Corey Feldman's a little bit better. How dare you, sir? (laughs) Oh, I'm on Team Feldman, too. Don't worry about it. (laughs) Okay. And then the other frog brother is just there. I'm kind of finding myself in this. It's not a great film, but Mm -hmm. it's entertaining enough. And I think there's a lot of really good, interesting ideas there that probably just needed a little bit more fleshing out. Like, why are the Frog Brothers the way they are? (laughs) We don't ever get an answer. They know about the vampires, but apparently they act like they've never actually staked one before. There's a lot of questions that my brain tends to overthink. And so, like, I will (laughs) say I enjoyed it quite a bit, but it is not a perfect film. Mm Mm-hmm. It's funny you said what you did, Angie, where, you know, if you mm-hmm. see this as a kid, you probably love it if you see it as an adult. And I saw it as an adult. Right. And I love this movie. <laughs> well, I said May. Yeah. <laughs> I have one problem with this movie, which we'll probably bring up in discussion. But mm-hmm. otherwise, I think this is the best film we've covered on the show so far and has set a new bar. <laughs> I mean, I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love the direction of this. I love the look, the music, the editing, how things take this very abstract way that is very much driven by the emotion of the sequence. I love the visualization. I love the characters. There is a lot that is unexplained. There's a lot of mm-hmm. backstory that is never told. But I like that. I agree. (laughs) I like that there's this in the moment feel of it doesn't matter where these characters come from. It matters where they are now. I love this whole world that this family falls into. And I love the humor. And I love the way Joel, we've talked a lot about Joel and his juggling of tones. I love the way that Joel will juggle tones within a scene of how there's a lot of powerful drama and horror going on in a scene that also is hilarious and funny as hell. I think this is a great culmination of what Joel has been building towards as a director, but also doing a lot of new things that he hadn't done before that I was really excited to see him do. I'll be honest, yeah, I'm kind of forgiving. It it is a bit of a weak plot. There's not much plot Mm -hmm. to it, but God, do I love how they tell that plot. (laughs) So that's where I stand. I was really surprised by how much I love this movie. So now our lead protagonist, Michael, played by Jason Patrick, Mm -hmm. what was it that didn't quite work with you? I guess I just never really empathized with him. He was very wooden and detached from the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You could see what was happening to him, but I wasn't relating to him. I Mm. always felt like Sam is seems to me at least the much more like sympathetic point of view character. Mm -hmm. Whereas like Michael is just sort of I don't know. I mean, he's very pretty. Don't get me wrong. (laughs) (laughs) But I just didn't really feel much of anything for Michael. I didn't feel his conflict of Oh, I want to drink blood, but I want to be good or, you know, anything like that. 
I liked him. I agree. He's probably not the greatest actor in the world, but I mm-hmm. think for the role that he has, I think he serves the purpose well because he's probably used to being the cool teenager guy. And all of a sudden, here's these other guys who are cooler than him, <laughs> and he has to deal with that to a degree. And yeah, I think there could have been some more subtlety added to some of this stuff. I especially love the scene at the end where there's like, you made me into a killer and whatever. It's, it's just so overblown that, yeah, okay, <laughs> you need to take that down like half a step. <laughs> it's a very almost tropey role, I think, yes. by this point. Yeah. You know, the conflicted guy who's brooding. It's very much Angel from Buffy, a million other TV shows, mm-hmm. Forever Night. This was like one of those Watchmen moments where everything that came after was influenced by it. Oh, yeah. Sure. And I think he and Kiefer really defined those two sides. Like, I mean, really, he and Kiefer are basically Spike and Angel. But Michael, yeah, I think the acting could have been a smidge better. But I think for what the role required, he was the right fit. Mm -hmm. I like everything that's there. I like Jason Patrick. I think he is a good performance. My thing, though, is what I think could have been emphasized more are two things. And one is we need to establish him more as a teenager before he goes through all this. Because I love that the movie has these great lines about, I think my brother's a vampire. He comes in late. He sleeps all day. His breath stinks. You know, it's like just describing Mm -hmm. a moody teenager. (laughs) You know, and they have fun jokes like that where it's a parallel between teenage detachment and becoming Mm -hmm. a vampire. And I wish they had gone further with that. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think also we needed to explore more his bond with the family. We don't get enough scenes between him and the mother. We have that one really lovely one where she tries to talk to him. But then it's like the two of them are never in a scene together for the majority of the movie. Right. Yeah. Even if you had one earlier on to show what their relationship was like before, that would help a lot. Yeah. You needed to have more of a direct exploration of the strains between him and his mother, but also the bonds between him and his mother. Mm -hmm. I think that could have just been worked in a little more thoroughly. Mm -hmm. Because I love like all the scenes with Diane Weist and Sam, but we needed more of her and Michael. Right. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's what it is, is like before the scene, he literally just sees star at the concert so he follows her yeah it's like within 10 minutes of this movie (laughs) yeah and then i mean yeah okay he's being freaked out because you know they're making him think he's eating maggots and worms and stuff but that's the same scene that they're already turning him right so much happens so fast exactly it's like i don't know this kid and he also doesn't look like a kid but that's (laughs) he was 18 the entire cast here is 18 Kiefer was 18 alice winter had just turned 18 and that's what they wanted to get people who actually were teenagers but okay. of age so that they didn't have to worry about the filming laws. Right, sure. He looks 25 to me. Maybe I've seen too many movies, but he looks 25. I don't know. And this was already after Solar Babies. Right, I know. <laughs> I noticed that in the Wikipedia credits. I'm like, Noel's going to talk about Solar Babies again. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I will say (laughs) for now. (laughs) Let me see. Yeah. Okay. No, actually. See, I just listened to the commentary where Joel was talking about how he was only 18. Now, he was born in 1966, so he would have been about 1920. Okay. A little bit older. Yeah. But it's not like a movie where they have like 27-year-olds pretending to be teenagers. You're right. You're right. (laughs) He just has such that square-jawed leading man look to him already. Mm Mm-hmm. That's probably what it is. He does seem a little impossible for being a teenager. (laughs) So then why don't we talk about the other main dynamic figure in this movie, Kiefer Sutherland as David. He's great. (laughs) I'm really not even that much of a Kiefer Sutherland fan, but I just really like him. Oh, we're going to see a lot of him in this project. (laughs) (laughs) You certainly believe he's the lead vampire up until the point that the movie suddenly wants you not to. Mm -hmm. He's charismatic. He is leading these guys to whatever he wants them to do. You can understand why Star would have gotten caught up with him. And even Michael, I think, in his own way, he does that perfect... I guess if y'all want to call it a spike type thing, which I was always a spike girl. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. I like him a lot. Yeah, I liked him a lot too. It's weird because he doesn't really have a whole lot to do. Mm -hmm. It's just more of just a... Charisma, yeah. Yes. Yeah, magnetic personality. He doesn't have that many lines. 
most of them are his him shouting out Michael. <laughs> but when he's just sitting there, like when he's offering him like rice that are maggots or noodles that are worms, you're just like, yeah, that would creep me out. But he's so charming. I can kind of <laughs> see why I might stick around and just hang out. He has that allure to him mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that confidence. That's what I love yep. is just how confident he is so many of the times and how much he's genuinely enjoying a lot of these moments. Like even when Michael just walks up and decks him, <laughs> David's response is literally just to smile right back at him. <laughs> Kiefer has long been, I think, a very fascinating actor. I just got his ups and his downs, but you never quite know what to expect when you're going into a Kiefer performance because mm-hmm. he'll always find odd little things to do. What I heard from the commentary and then even having read the script, David did have a lot more dialogue, but he would do a take where he would just drop the line and just basically say it with a look. And Joel was like, let's just leave it that way. (laughs) So it's like they intentionally pared down his dialogue. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But even just bits like after the bonfire massacre where he's just rising up that hill, Mm -hmm. you know, or Mm -hmm. him on the motorcycle. He's that perfect punk escapism, Mm -hmm. that ideal of living apart and being on your own and nobody's rules and of course we should bring up this did start as a spin on peter pan's the lost boys i think this is a really great spin on that where it's that allure of just being on your own and not having to listen to your parents or listen to the man and now you're a vampire Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, that's the whole appeal of vampirism. Whereas like werewolf is you can't control it and you just give in to the rage. Like a vampire knows it's evil and it loves being evil. Like to me, that's the best kind of vampire. And he definitely embodies that. And that's where I find this kind of interesting how a vampire is something you can't just be turned into. You also have to want to accept it. Mm -hmm. And that's where the whole thing with Star and Michael is, is like getting them to the point where they're willing to start feeding because then they'll finish their transformation yeah he's a very alluring character but he's also a very frightening character because he's so just confident about everything you can never phase him Mm -hmm. unless you're literally killing someone right in front of him (laughs) (laughs) and he's threatening to come kill your entire family afterwards yeah i mean god just that shot of him roaring down the tunnel is just classic Mm -hmm. yeah then the other part of that triangle and this is my main problem with the movie is Mm. i do feel the character of star is underwritten and underdeveloped yeah oh yeah definitely she's literally just there as a love interest to give michael motivation she gives him a little exposition every now and then but she has no real motivations other than of course protecting the kid which is Mm -hmm. such a typical thing for a woman yeah i agree with angie she really just didn't have a whole lot to add I wish there was just a little hint of personality other than just she thinks Michael is hot and she (laughs) wants to protect Laddie, I guess. Yeah. And that's about it. We don't even know what their relationship is, if they're just both half vampires and that she Mm -hmm. feels protective of him or if they're like actually related. It's not clear. I kind of got the impression that they're both part of this messed up family, sort of. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I wish there was just a little bit more to her. Yeah, I agree. She's just underwritten. Yeah, and I think she, again, is the first act is rushed. They go too far too fast in this movie. Mm -hmm. And you don't really get that build of the relationship between her and Michael. Again, what was fascinating comparing this to Near Dark was Near Dark, it's also a guy meets this young woman vampire who he is intended to be her next meal, but she gradually moves away from wanting to do that and ends up inadvertently pulling him into this clan. And Lost Boys, basically the same thing, but they don't have enough room to really play that out. Mm -hmm. You know, you never really get the sense that she was actually luring him in to eat him no no it really doesn't make sense with the overall plan from max right no and then you never really get a sense of her changing her mind and having to convince the others to bring him into the group yeah and that's where i think you know there's so much focus on definitely a homoerotic subtext between the relationship of michael and david but we don't get enough of the actual build between michael and star Mm -hmm. even though they have a sex scene it it was very tastefully done not gratuitous sex scene but it just didn't feel earned character wise no it's just sort of there it's a good music video i guess yeah (laughs) (laughs) that's about it yeah and that's the other thing i don't think you needed laddie in this movie you could have cut out laddie entirely you could have had her photo be the missing child label on the milk Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you could have had her starting to give into her vampirism at the end of the movie and the frog brothers and sam being like do we kill her do we not kill her do we kill her (laughs) you could have cut laddie entirely out of this movie and given her more And there also needed to be a conversation between her and Michael where she talks about what she's lost, what she's left behind. 
the whole life that she used to lead before she was pulled into this. Because again, if we're exploring this as a metaphor for teenagers trying to go off and be on their own, mm -hmm. there's consequences to leaving that family behind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's more that they could have done to deepen the character and given her more to do. Mm -hmm. Not things that would have had to change significantly that much. And again, once Michael meets David, it's just Michael and David. And I think she's there because if they had gone too gay, the studio would have said no. <laughs> right. Yeah, sure. She's almost the reminder that this is about straight people, even though, you know, Joel is kind of like, but really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that would have been interesting had they played more with that. But again, the way that the commercial studios worked at the time, they would not have let that fly. No. J.D., what did you think about Corey Hamas, Sam? I know you, you had a little bit to say about him there at first. A lot of the line deliveries feel like I love the lines. Like, he gets some really good jokes in. But I think the way he delivers them, they don't quite land as effectively as if they... And admittedly, he was super young at this point. I don't mm. think he'd been in too much. Because I know this was like his first film with Feldman. So this was like pretty early on in his career. I know mm. he had done Lucas by this point. And admittedly, I haven't watched Lucas in probably longer than I've seen Lost Boys. So I don't really remember that much at all. I really haven't seen too many films with Corey Haim. I honestly don't remember if he was a good actor or not. I just didn't care for a lot of his delivery here. I thought the character was actually great. And I love a lot of the lines like, wait till I tell mom is a fantastic line. <laughs> it's just that something about the way he says it, it just doesn't have that patter, the pacing that it really needed to really deliver the lines as effectively as they could have been. That's fair. There were certainly some scenes where I was like, oh, man, come on, kid. But there's like the scene in the tub. <laughs> where he's singing along with the song that's just genuinely kind of charming and cute. I'll give you that. I'll totally give you that scene. That is a fun scene. <laughs> he's not a great actor. Like I said, I definitely think Feldman is the stronger Corey at this point. I felt like in like the first act or so, he really wasn't working for me, but then he kind of grew on me. As he became this kid that was obsessed with trying to prove that the guy his mom is dating is totally a vampire. And once he really got into that stuff, I started to like him a lot more. And like I said, to me, he's kind of our eyes through the film. And maybe that's just because I'm a nerd myself. So it's like, as someone who would know a lot about the comics and the different things, it's like trying to fit in and figure it all out. And you just meet these two kids who seem to totally know everything and you're like yeah sure i'll go with that let's kill some vampires you know so i mean like yeah he was a little clunky and awkward but i did enjoy him see i love them in this movie <laughs> 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 i love the character i love the energy i love the writing again yeah he just had all the best lines in the movie mm -hmm. he had all the best clothes in this movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man, just talking about Joel Schumacher and fashion design. This is again, he had the same designer on this as St. Elmo's Fire. And boy, did they have fun with especially Max and <laughs> Sam. And Marco. Let's not forget Marco with his midriff top and his multicolored jacket. jacket and mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was some loud, loud designs. and Yes. <laughs> oh, I loved. Even his pajamas are like these bright uh -huh. blue and pinks. Mm -hmm. I loved Corey Heyman in this movie. I thought his performance fit the character because it's all about exuberant energy. Mm -hmm. There's even that whole scene where Michael is talking to Star and having that conversation while Sam is huddled up in a blanket, terrified on his bed, like, how could you drink someone else's blood? <laughs> <laughs> I love just how excitable and energetic he is. So I did not have any problems with Sam. He definitely makes it look natural. There's no doubt about that. He's not playing a role. I mean, he's definitely fun. You can see why he had a career because he does yeah. light up the screen. No, I don't think Corey Haim was always the strongest actor, but I think it was a part that really suited him well. Mm -hmm. hmm. So why don't we lead that into the Frog Brothers? <laughs> I don't know why Corey Feldman spends the whole movie talking like this, but I love it. He's doing a Sylvester Stallone impression. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> that sounds about right. You gotta call us if you have any preps. <laughs> These kids are 13 going on 35. Gotta get a good steak and drive it through your brother's house. <laughs> 
it's great. Like, the thing that I like about them and talking about how this world is kind of underdeveloped, it's entirely possible that these guys are solely going about what they've read from comic books and movies, and it's entirely possible that they have done this before. Like, I can see it either way, that either they know what they're doing or they don't know what they're doing. No, I think they do have a drop line that they've never staked anyone before. Do they say that? Okay. But I think they obviously know that there's vampires here and they've been researching. Right. They've been prepping for this. Their confidence just makes them funny as hell either way you look at it. Like, they're just entertaining. They found their calling and they are dedicated to it. Yes. Yes. And I guess that's supposed to be their parents sleeping in the background of the comic shop the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, I guess that's how you get two boys like this is parents that are just... I think the credit is Mother Frog and Father Frog or something like that. (laughs) To me, they're just endlessly entertaining. I don't know if they're the best part of the movie because Keith or Sutherland's also pretty great, but they're definitely ranked pretty high up there. Yeah, I love the parents how it's like the parents own this comic shop, but the kids run the comic shop. Mm. (laughs) Because their parents are literally just burned out hippies from the previous era. (laughs) I thought they were a lot of fun. Okay, first off, nerd nitpick. There are more than five or four issues of Batman 14 out there. So let us hope that it's the beginning and end of all the mistakes Joel will be associated regarding Batman. Okay. To be honest, they mentioned Laurie LaMare. That's an actual deep cut for a casual Superman fan. So like, okay, I'll give you that. But I thought it was one of those things where it took me a little while to get into like, okay, the movie is so like dark when it's focusing on the teenagers and then like you get into the kids and they're just so spastic. And I really wasn't getting into Corey Haim that much. But when Corey Feldman and then his brother were there, it was just like, okay, I get this film. <laughs> this is a comedy and it is a horror film at the same time. I'm okay with this because both parts are working for me independently of each other. And I think they really make that work. Primarily Feldman. I really don't have much to say about Jameson. But he still bounces off Feldman. Well. Yeah, and he's yeah. doing the same thing that Feldman's doing. He's a straight man. Yeah. But the depth to which Feldman commits to that performance. <laughs> yeah. He's doing the yeah. same thing, but he's not doing it as well. But I will say, like, both are fun. And I mm-hmm. haven't seen the sequels, but I kind of would like to see what happens to them eventually. Oh, mm-hmm. you're going to. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there at some point down the road. Yay. Yeah. Building on what you said, Joel said that the studio never quite got the film as he was making it because they would keep asking him, is this a comedy or is this a horror film? And he would always answer yes. (laughs) And again, we've mentioned in the past, Joel likes to juggle tones. He doesn't Mm -hmm. always pull it off. I know in St. Elmo's Fire, especially didn't think he quite pulled it off, but... I really like how he blends tones here. And again, it's like he'll have his dramatic sequences punctuated with humor and his humorous sequences punctured with drama. And he knows how to build on those moments. And again, the Frog Brothers, just that they committed to the lengths that they did (laughs) of not only incorporating these characters in this story, but just the performances, the way that they're like prepping to go into the vampire den and they're checking each other's stakes and everything. Mm. (laughs) And again, how these are complete dedicated experts who have never actually seen combat. They're like the militia nuts the militia nuts who are absolutely dedicated and trained their lives so that one day they're going to have to go to war and they've never been to war yeah Mm -hmm. and in fact most of the people who have been to war are just looking at them like really (laughs) and i like how these guys are just so deep into this yeah yeah but again you never really get how things start between them and sam because it's so weird how they just see him in the comic shop and are instantly like offering him this comic and you know one day this will save your life Mm -hmm. yeah i wonder if they do that to every like kid that comes in (laughs) probably or they just felt something towards sam i don't know and i love how this film through Corey feldman is what originated the term vamp out Hmm. Hmm. because you have that line of like okay and if you vamp out i promise you i'll stake you without giving it a second thought (laughs) (laughs) and also i think this is not the first film to have vampire faces but i think this definitely Mm -hmm. started what led to the buffy trend of when suddenly someone would vamp out into their vampire makeup sure yeah instead of just the teeth coming face changes a little too yeah yeah Yeah, I get that pronounced brow, some contacts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What'd you think of that makeup effect in this one, Angie? Mm, It's better than the Buffy makeup. (laughs) I think it's better shot than the Buffy makeup. Yeah. I guess the main thing is the contacts or maybe just some of the stuff around the brow. Like it kind of stunted their facial expressions Mm -hmm. a bit. And for that reason, it's kind of, mm, but it's okay. It's not overly done at least. So it's not horribly distracting. I think Kiefer pulls it off really well. The rest of them, 
it works. I like Alex Winters. He really dug into that. Yeah. But like when you see like Michael or Max later on, they don't look as intimidating as, and admittedly like Michael's not supposed to be intimidating, but mm-hmm. I don't know. I just, for whatever reason, like especially in that scene that you described where he's crawling to get Sam mm-hmm. out from their den, that is iconic as it gets, I think, as yeah. far as like movie vampires. I think it works in certain contexts. I think it was just the problem was I imagine that they just probably at the time didn't have a whole lot of money. I think this was a very low budget movie and actually had its budget slashed because they wanted to go with unknown actors. Mm. Okay. I mean, the effects for the most part are good, but I think the makeup, it's just hit or miss. It's just certain scenes look really, really good or they look okay. Yeah. I think it looks better than like an average episode of Buffy. (laughs) With the exception of Max, where I think they overdid it just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think the makeup is fine. It's not great. But it doesn't really detract from the movie. Mm -hmm. My only problem is you really could have just had all those scenes done where you just give them a little bit of fang and maybe some contact lenses, but otherwise just let the actor's face be the actor's face. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you kind of needed that for the Michael bit where he's like, I don't want anyone to see me like this, but Mm. I still don't think you really needed it. No. Let's lead into we, we saw that character of Max. Yeah. It's so weird seeing Lorelai's dad from the Gilmore Girls being all evil, <laughs> but I thought he did a really good job. It's one of those things where they do a good job of like making you, because I had such vague memories of the film. I remember that there was a surprise head vampire and I was like, it's this guy. And then they make you think, okay, it's going to be this guy. And then they go out of their way to prove that it's not that guy. And he's just such a mild-mannered, nerdy, like, milk toast manager of a video store. You're like, okay, it's not going to be him. And then they reverse that and like, no, it is actually him. The only problem is I think he doesn't quite sell the intimidation at the end. Like, I just don't buy him as a evil, I want you, Lucy. Especially after such a great villain with David. The super secret boss is just kind of like, oh, it's the boring guy. Okay. Yeah. But I think he did well for what the role was. It's just like the way he was playing the character, you couldn't do that 180 completely smoothly. Yeah. I mean, I think beyond that one scene where the dog tries to attack her and they do point out, oh, we only see him at night. It's like there just isn't enough lead up for it to really be believable. I don't know if we needed to see some scenes where he really was trying to create conflict between her and the kids that you could think, oh, maybe something's not quite right with this guy. Something a little more than him just telling the vampires, get out of my store once. We just needed a little bit more of a lead up to make that turn believable at the end. We know when they're doing their whole thing of, oh, he must be the head vampire. Okay, it's a natural thing for like, oh, here's this new guy dating my mom. I don't trust him. But I don't feel like we were given enough for us to really believe that with them. I think he does a good job in the role. It's just not a turn I really feel like it's not written well enough in the movie. I think there would have been like a family dinner scene like before anybody says Mm -hmm. anything about vampires where mom is just introducing the boys to her new boyfriend. Right. You could have had like a scene where there's a bit of tension there and just have Sam really be like, there's something not right about this guy. And that seed when all of a sudden the vampires become a thing, he's like, aha, I know what's going on here then to be proven wrong and then to be proven yeah. right later on. Yeah, I agree. I don't have a problem with any of the lead up. My problem is I think we needed in the climax a scene with David and Max before David dies. That would have also helped, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do the big reveal before David is fully killed. Mm-hmm. Even just the subtext of it, I like that he's a milk toast master vampire because he created this entire brood of vampires who are teenagers who rebel against him. I think he created David, but then David just rebelled against him and ran off and created this entire gang around himself. And Max is just pissed off at him for not, you know, there's a very interesting subtext to be had there, but they could have explored it a little better of technically David is the master of that brood, but still Max is the one who created him. And yet the two of them are at odds. Mm -hmm. They don't get along. David does not follow his orders. I know that's why he's like, I wanted to bring a mother in to finally, you know, help me straighten out these kids. But it's like, I don't really see David suddenly giving into a mother figure either. No. And that's where you really could have had the whole clash of play Max and David as like a father and son and have the rebelling of David against Max be a dark mirror to the rebelling of Michael against his mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Play up. That's a worst case scenario. These are consequences. And again, to further explore that metaphor of teenage disassociation with being a vampire. Right. 
that's all I would really need is just at least one scene there at the end where you actually get to see David and Max as their vampire selves and how they're relating to each other. Yeah, I kind of feel like it's a fun movie, but if they had really explored those metaphors just a little bit better, then it could have moved into the realm of great movie. And they kind of missed that shot. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I still think it's a pretty great movie, but... I agree that there's not that much you would have had to change right. to bring in those elements. Mm-hmm. Again, I think in order to lift this up, you just needed a little longer of a first act, mm-hmm. at least an additional scene or two between Michael and his mother, mm-hmm. get rid of Laddie, give Star mm-hmm. a little more character, a little more backstory, a little more connection with Michael, and then explore the connection between Max and David. And that's something that you could have pretty easily changed while while still keeping like a good 90% of the movie as is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think this is a film that could have been made better, but I'm still really happy with what we got. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, I'm wondering if that's just because this was still an era where a lot of older movies are like that because they just didn't have the ability to finesse the material as easily as we do in the more recent years to the point where we kind of over finesse material now. Yeah. Mm. Things are almost a little too perfected and thought out. But anyways, one of the other interesting things about the character of Max is that it's been pointed out The glasses, the outfits, the hairstyle, Edward Herman is made into a perfect mirror image of John Hughes. Hmm. Hmm. If you go look back at pictures of John Hughes, you will find he had those exact same glasses. That's how he did his hair. He would occasionally wear those type of suits. It's funny because, you know, this was right at the peak John Hughes era. Right. John Hughes was someone who Joel, we talked about this on St. Elmo's Fire, they worked in the same building and offices across from one another. So is this just a coincidence or was he literally just having a little fun there? Hmm. It's interesting. I assume he didn't bring that up on the commentary at all. He did not. That's just something I've seen people pointing out online. I mean, like you even have references like in Sam's room, he's got the Molly Ringwald poster and Mm -hmm. the incredible Rob Lowe poster he also has. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Poster that's about the size of a door. Yeah. I think this is just, it, it's a film. It could have been pushed a little bit further, but I'm still, I'm just really glad with what we got. And, and we haven't talked about the character Grandpa yet, played by Bernard Hughes. I love Grandpa. He's fun. Yeah. I mean, he just gets some of the best lines. Like, if you read the TV guy, you don't need a TV, you know. <laughs> All right, let's drive into town. Wait, aren't we actually going to drive? No, it's about as close as I ever like to get. <laughs> yeah. And my favorite is, of course, don't you know the rule about if you take somebody's car without their permission, you fill it up afterwards? No. Well, now you know. Yeah, while well, they're the- standing on the stairs covered in vampire blood, carrying an unconscious woman upstairs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know if he really adds a whole lot other than just comic relief yeah. in the deus ex machina of the end. Right. But he nails the humor in there so well. Like, he's probably the funniest part of the film. Hmm. Every scene, he just steals the scene. This is my shelf. A root beer and double... He didn't call them double stuffed, because I guess they weren't called double stuffed yet. It was like double with Oreos. Yeah. Don't touch them. Like, <laughs> well, and I love how he even built his own little cardboard sign yes. over the shelf that says old fart stuff. <laughs> He's crazy, but he's crazy in a non-harmful way. And so <laughs> He is wildly eccentric. Right. Why does he know to drive into his own house to kill the vampire? Who knows? He probably saw it from the porch. <laughs> Why did he come back? Well, it's easy because the widow would say, well, it's not one of our date nights. Oh, <laughs> And then he comes back, parks the car, gets up, sees all the stuff going on. Probably that vampire stuff is still pouring out of the pipes. <laughs> and then he sees what's going on, sees the truck full of steaks, gets the idea. The rest is history. Sure. But I kind of like that whole going back and watching this film again with the reading that Grandpa knows what's going on. Mm-hmm. He probably knows his grandson is turning into a vampire. He probably knows they're discovering what all is going on. He's just kind of like, eh, they got it. <laughs> <laughs> It's a learning experience. You know, kids. <laughs> well, I know that those fence posts, those were Chekhov's fence posts. Like, you see that fence post, you're like, there's going to be a vampire in the end of one of those by the end of the film. <laughs> and sure enough. Yeah. Yeah. And again, like that whole climax, mm-hmm. the one vampire who gets killed in the tub. So much blood. <laughs> so much blood. Like, I'm pretty sure when I saw it the first time, that kind of freaked me out because I was still <laughs> young enough to be easily grossed out by blood and stuff. But man, 
Wow. What a way to go. So much spectacle. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. If no one's seen this movie, he gets thrown into a bathtub full of holy water and garlic, melts, and then literally it gets into the pipes and everything in the kitchen, in the bathroom is exploding out. The toilet explodes. Yes. These geysers of muddy vampire blood. Yeah. And I love how like five minutes later as other stuff is happening, it's still gushing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's made its way down to the kitchen now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then, J.D., what would you think of Death by Stereo? Uh, that was just a great line. And then I like the fact that the vampire was so, like, confident, like, haha, you missed the heart, and then won't miss again. And then he's just still walking right towards the kid <laughs> with the arrow pointed right at him, but he's so confident, and he just doesn't expect the kid to be able to make the shot, and he does. I mean, the other non-Alex Winter, non Kiefer Sutherland vampires, <laughs> I really don't have a whole lot of thoughts on, but at least they all had memorable deaths. Mm -hmm. And they were literally just cast in the movie because they were striking looking male models. Makes I sense. I can believe that. You need to fill out the actual gang with a gang. Yeah. And I can't find out what much happened to the blonde one, but I know the one with dark hair, he's actually a musician and has continued on with the band. Yeah, okay. And yeah, Alex Winter was just cast because he was an interesting looking actor. And mm. Jamie Gertz was cast entirely because of Solar Babies. Jason Patrick had just made solar babies with her and recommended her mm -hmm. for the role and they were like oh okay but i mean yeah again star in the climax gets nothing to do yeah just don't kill laddie that's it i mean there's mm -hmm. also really no scenes between star and david like we never really get a sense of what that relationship is i mean other than right. you know some tense moments when he's like come ride on my bike mm -hmm. we never really get a sense of what the history is there why he chose her why she's part of the group why she's the only woman of the group yeah we never have any sense of why laddie is there no i mean i think you could make an interesting story out of it if you wanted to yeah but you have to fill it in yourself. There's nothing given to you. Right. And then we should probably bring up the way this film was originally written. I sadly do not have this script. It's one of those scripts that everyone in the script collecting market would love to get. The original script for this, it was written as a children's movie. It was mm -hmm. written as a literal adaptation of Peter Pan, The Lost Boys. David's character was named Peter. Star's character was named Wendy. And it was supposed to be a spin on The Lost Boys from Peter Pan if they were all vampires and were still luring children out of their bedrooms at night to become mm -hmm. one of them. I think it's fair to say a lot of that is still here. There's still a lot of undertones to that. Mm. But I don't know how well that would have worked as a film. And I know Joel Schumacher gets kind of a lot of crap for saying that he made the characters older because he wanted to make them sexier. But it's not just that. It's that he wanted to be edgier. He wanted to get into the darker areas of the story more, which he was afraid that it wouldn't be easy to do with children. Sure. Yeah. And again, this was going to be directed by Richard Donner straight off of Goonies. Yeah. I could see like that being like Goonies part two, except with vampires. Mm -hmm. And everyone was supposed to be like 10 to 12 except for the frog brothers who were eight-year-old boy scouts <laughs> if you could find the right kids to do that that would be fun <laughs> right well and i think again you know monster squad came out and he had a lot of those sure. same beats too and yeah i don't really have a problem with the way they rewrote them as making them older characters there are still some things they could have dug into this, but I don't mm -hmm. think we lost anything by not getting that version because I really like the version we got. Yeah, I agree. I think it just shows in that I feel like the kids are at least better developed than the older cast where you can yeah. tell like they didn't quite get as much of a chance to think it through. You know what we were missing? Hmm. We never got a scene between Grandpa and the Frog Brothers. That would be fun. Give it a proper epilogue. <laughs> or even just when they were over at dinner that one night. Yeah. Or you even find out the only time he goes into town is to stop by their comic shop. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how they know each other. And then what do you think of just the use of the location? Because this was actually filmed in Santa Cruz, but they couldn't name it that because Santa Cruz was actually the murder capital of the U.S. because of a serial killer in the 70s. Mm. And they were like, we don't want you to mention that. Yeah, please don't do that. Yeah. It made for some fun set pieces, for sure. Like that opening scene with them on the carousel is just a lot of fun with all the bright lights. I guess I didn't necessarily think of it one way or the other, but it was pretty. <laughs> I love the use of the boardwalk. I've always found boardwalks kind of interesting just because I'm from Kansas and we don't have those here. <laughs> so you don't really get to have like a centralized touristy hub like that. And just having like Ferris wheels and all that stuff. It just looks cool. I think they used it well. Yeah. And I was surprised to see that Santa Cruz didn't like to be associated with this film at first. But as this then came out and became like a huge cult sensation, there's places there that hold outdoor screenings of this movie every week. 
So it's become a part of the tourist attraction, even though a <laughs> lot of the spots that were actually used in this movie, like the comic book store, which was a real comic book store that was there, or the place where the band is playing, were destroyed in an earthquake. Mm. Hmm. I love the atmosphere of the town. I just love how he just instantly establishes the place. We've talked a lot about how Joel is great at building a kind of world around the characters. Mm -hmm. Even though there are chunks of this film, like the entire interior of the house was just a set at Warner Brothers. Like the vampire cave was just a set. He does a really great job of using that location to make you feel a part of that location. Mm -hmm. I kind of also love it. It says a lot about the director that during that montage, you get one shot of a woman in bikini bottoms. And then we follow that with three minutes of shirtless saxophone man. <laughs> <laughs> I love saxophone, man. He's hard to forget. <laughs> yeah. He is. Well, and he is apparently was a regular part of Tina Turner's touring band. Okay. <laughs> well, it was the 80s. You couldn't escape a saxophone. No. Well, that's a very standout saxophone. <laughs> yeah. They clearly found the head saxophonist. The body oil helps push it over the top. Oh, God. <laughs> he oils his instrument and he oils himself all in the same go. That was a memorable thing. Mm -hmm. What was the most hilarious thing about the audio commentary? You get to that scene and Joel is suddenly really excited and literally saying, this is one of my favorite things I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> I know we'll eventually get to this, but I want to say the comic book, like one of the covers have him on it. I hope so. I think so. We'll discover it. I don't know if they try to build a story around him or what, but I want to say I remember reading about that. <laughs> Just to let people know, there's a lot of other Lost Boy stuff. We will get to that at some point. Yes, so. yes. Overall, what did you think about like just the way the film was shot and edited? I thought it was beautiful, especially when you consider the fact that it was like an $8 million film, which even for that time was not a lot. I mean, there's a few scenes that maybe were a little clunky, but for the most part, it is just a gorgeous looking film, especially when you get towards the end with all the red lighting and it doesn't overdo it so much where it feels like, okay, it's red lighting. We get it. It's vampires. Mm -hmm. It's just a subtle effect, you know, because the toilets blew up or whatever <laughs> blood. You don't have to explain it too hard. It's just, it is what it is and it works. It's beautiful. It's some of the best cinematography I think I've seen from an 80s film in a little while. I really only have one complaint, and y'all may completely disagree with me, but the crane shots, whenever I guess it was supposed to be vampire point of view sweeping down on the victims, they always just, to me, felt a little cheesy and just didn't really work. It always kind of just took me out of the film whenever that would happen. Mm, yeah. Beyond that... The beginning of the film, I didn't really find scary at all. I felt like a lot of the suspense beats were a little obvious at times. But then by the time you get to the climax and the blood flying everywhere, I feel like he did a much better job with the horror. And definitely that scene in the cave when he's grabbing Sam and they're desperately trying to get away. That was all really stronger. And then there's at least two or three scenes, like the biker chase, the love scene, and I feel like there's one other one I'm forgetting, that are basically just straight up music videos yeah. in the <laughs> middle of the film. And they're great. They work really well. They're fun. So it's interesting. It's kind of all over the place. He goes everywhere. He tries for everything. I felt like at least in some places he might have missed the mark a little bit. But overall, it was really good. Yeah, I will agree with you on like those two vamp attacks that we have early mm -hmm. on because we have the security guard who's killed and then the yeah. couple who steal the comic books. I still like the scene with the couple that steals the comic books because I love just the funny thing. He's trying to make out and she wants to read the comics and then suddenly the roof of their car gets ripped <laughs> off. But I agree. I know part of that was budgetary was they couldn't really do that much in terms of the actual vamp attacks because they needed their climax and they needed the bonfire scene. Sure. And so they also wanted to keep them off screen. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you. There's not much like actual tension or fear to those. I think there was yeah. much more tension to the opening of DC Cab where they're wearing all the clown masks <laughs> and chasing them in the cab. Right. <laughs> so I, I think there's ways that they could have played with that a bit better. Mm -hmm. Like it would have been cool like to actually keep the security guard on the carousel and have a horror scene built around the carousel. Mm, yeah. yeah. But once you get to Michael having his hallucinations when he first gets the blood or, again, the bonfires, the bonfire sequence is spectacularly well put together. Mm -hmm. And again, I love how it, you know, this is a very colorful movie. There's a lot of bouncy colors, all stuff. And then that scene is just red, yeah. bright red until they start throwing bodies on the pyre. And then you get these gouts of blue flame and just the abstract imagery, the way it's cutting into them, tearing people apart. Michael being driven with the thirst. And I love how this movie is 
shot. And the cinematographer this, Michael Chapman, he was a major Academy Award cinematographer at the time. He had done Taxi Driver, Raging Bull. Mm. In more recent years, did Space Jam. <laughs> okay. He looks to be retired now, but this is the only film he did with Joel Schumacher, and I kind of regret it because I love things that he did with the lighting. I love the use mm-hmm. of color. I love the way he framed the shots. And again, the editing. And, and it should be pointed out, Joel Schumacher, as we've established, is not one of the directors who came out of the music video school of direction, mm-hmm. but he was a fan. When MTV first emerged, he really became a fan. Mm. And this was him intentionally, he even brings it up on the commentary, intentionally trying to play with the abstract ways that music videos would tell a story and the editing styles. So I think he kind of gets lumped in with those directors a lot, but I think he was also very influenced by them and was trying to bring something new to his own style. Makes sense. Yeah. And I'll be interested to see how that carries on over time. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, I got to bring it up. You might have missed it because it just pops up here and there once or twice. But there was this little indie song called Cry Little Sister. <laughs> Angie, what did you think <laughs> about that song, Cry Little Sister? Oh, wait. It sure as heck sounds like it's about incest. Ooh. <laughs> Maybe that was just me. <laughs> Maybe it was because it was playing during... Was it playing during the love scene? I think so, yes. Yeah, I think so. Uh, no. There's a lot of silly music in this <laughs> movie some of it works some of it doesn't i enjoy the rhythm of it and the beat of it but yeah the lyrics mm, are a little questionable Mm -hmm. it's very much that era of 80s in excess style i mean it's an enjoyable song i just think they overused it just a little bit and the lyrics were a little weird. To be fair, this was a song written for this film. Mm-hmm. It was original to this film, and he had been given the script, and it is a song about Star. If you say so. Yeah, <laughs> but again, I think Star is so underdeveloped, it doesn't really ring. Right. But boy, did they get their money's worth with this song by like, no, we're going to open with this song. We're <laughs> going to have it pop up throughout. Literally, the score is built around the melody of this song, so that even when this song isn't playing, they're playing the song. Mm. It's in the love scene. It's in David's death scene when David dies and is suddenly <laughs> bathed in white light. You get the child choir. Thou shalt not. F- Why? <laughs> I love the song. I uh. think it's used well for the most part, but boy, is it used a lot. And I don't think it needed to be used in that David moment because that was just a no. little too much on top. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a bit much overall for me. Yeah. You can't forget it, but uh, yeah. no, no, thank you. And what's funny is this soundtrack, this big best-selling soundtrack, this is not like Joel had someone bring a bunch of music to him. Joel himself, because he's a big fan of the music industry and the people in it, he put together all the soundtrack for himself because he knew a lot of these people just from all his connections and all that stuff. Mm. He was the one who arranged for that song to be made for this film. There's that funny song that Corey Haim sings while he's in the bathtub. That was mm-hmm. always one of Joel's favorite songs as a child. <laughs> he was the one who had the real big connection with, I think these vampires would be drawn to Jim Morrison in the doors. So that's why he arranged to get that cover of People Are Strange that plays over the end credits and during that montage. That was an interesting choice of the Elton John cover. I think that plays over the end credits. I'm pretty sure that's an Elton John song. Don't let the sun go down Don't on me. Don't let the sun go down on me. Yeah, which, okay, so George Michael did a duet with him of it. But yeah, it's an Elton John song. Yeah, this one was uh, covered by Roger Daltrey. Yeah, like I said, that's a very, I guess, the sun reference with vampires. I guess that's what he was thinking. Right. It was just an interesting choice. And again, it's interesting seeing Joel do things that we didn't really think I mean, because we know he comes from a very fashion background, but now he's putting Mm -hmm. together soundtracks. And again, we just came out of a whole bunch of movies where he did for Motown Records. Right. I'm going to be interested to see, like, as we go on, is Joel going to be, like, pulling together strong soundtracks for his movies? Well, it makes me wonder how much involvement he had with his Batman soundtracks. Now, I guess we'll find out then. Oh, yeah, with, like, Seal and Smashing Pumpkins. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Those are pretty distinctive soundtracks. Mm Mm-hmm. Because, again, Joel is one of the guys who goes to the Hollywood parties all the time so he knows everyone. Mm-hmm. So he's someone who can literally just call up someone and say, hey, want to be want to have a song <laughs> in my movie? And we're seeing the start of him becoming an influential figure in the Hollywood industry. I mean, coming off of a decade where he had built that. Mm-hmm. You know, first as a screenwriter and now as a director. And Again, it's going to be interesting getting into how all of his films are going to come together from this point on. He's definitely stepped up a bar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just want to talk about Alex Winter because I'm Bill and Ted obsessed. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I love how it's not until they're hanging upside down that I realized how long his hair was. Oh, those extensions oh, are so fake. I love it. I know. 
<laughs> My He's notes say nervous. baby Bill and his mullet. He just, like, Alex Winter's not a good actor, okay? I'm not saying he is, but he just always He's looks so delighted to be there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even in his vamp face, he's milking it. Yes, he's just, he makes these faces. He's having so much fun. And I just love, (laughs) I don't know. Like, Marco is not a big part. He definitely has more lines than any of the other lackeys. But he's still, at least to me, like, very noticeable. Right. And like I said, the midriff top, again. I guess he worked out (laughs) a lot and he was proud of it. I don't know. And the jacket. Oh, my God, the jacket. The jacket, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. When he turned around and I saw the back of that jacket for the first time, it was amazing. (laughs) So, yeah, that's the main thing. And I guess we didn't really talk about Diane Weist either. Oh, God, yeah. Diane Weist is the the mother. Yeah. I loved her in Parenthood. I've watched that film about 10 million times, too. It's a one note role, but she's very sweet. I like her a lot. Yeah, I mean, I kind of wish there was a little bit more with her and the kids, but I think she felt a little bit better fleshed out than a lot of the films from the 80s where you have the mom role. Usually that's just like, we don't really want to have a parent, and so we'll just have one, and usually they're just minimized to the point where they could practically be non-existent. Well, and they also needed her to have a relationship with Max. There is a plot reason for it. No, I know. And because of that, she felt a little bit fleshed out compared to other parents in movies around this time. And I think Diana Weiss is a great actress. I mean, she really doesn't get a lot to do other than just be like, why is everyone acting so weird? But every once in a while, like, she does get some, you know, like when she asks about the garlic, it was just timed so well with what Corey Hayne was doing with taking off the robe. And you see, like, the chain of garlic. <laughs> that just makes me laugh. And if she had said it, like, a beat earlier, or a beat late, it wouldn't have worked as well. I actually do love how the film has so much prominence about the prepping of garlic. And then you get to the line, garlic doesn't do anything to us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We'll try holy water. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Diane Weist, it's a character that's, I think, made up for by the performance. And she just brings an absolutely mm-hmm. lovely performance. And I like all the scenes that she's in. And again, I think you could have just added a few more scenes. Again, if you had yeah. added more scenes with her and Michael, that would have built up her part stronger. Mm-hmm. And again, had you brought Max into the climax earlier while David was still alive, you could even have her and Max come home and have the big reveal before you even fight all the other vampires and have the mother be caught up in the whole climax too Mm -hmm. because again there's always so many of these horror movies where they keep the parents off to the side and it's like i always like the horror movies where you actually see the parents and the kids having to work together Mm -hmm. sure i think that would have been fun but again i still like her performance i love the scene with her and the dog i thought that was really well done Mm -hmm. i love the frustrations that she's having with i'm just trying to go out and have a life and date and you guys keep dragging me out of it I like the performance, but again, it's like they could have added more to it. Yeah. And as we come to our final thoughts, I think that's my big thing is I think this is a film that I really enjoyed. I really loved. But even talking about it with you guys, I realized they Mm. could have gone further with it. I do think this is a very good movie as it is, but it could have been great. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. But I'm still not going to hold that against it. I still think it's a really good, enjoyable film. I think of the films that Joel has directed, I think it's the strongest one we've had so far. And it'll be interesting to see how the films that come after compare to it. Yeah, I mean, I can see why so many people love it, why it's become kind of a classic 80s movie. It's a lot of fun. Like this time I was intentionally looking at it with a critical eye. But certainly when I watched it back then, I didn't have any reservations at all. It's just, it's fun. It's a fun movie. It's enjoyable. Yeah, my thoughts echo Angie. I think looking at it with a critical eye, I noticed some flaws, but I still think it's an enjoyable time. And I think if you haven't seen it, you should probably check it out. Yeah, I think it's one of those films where, again, the story itself is thin and could have been developed a little further. Mm -hmm. But it is one of those ones where if you just go with it and just go with the ride of it and just let it pull you into the moment and the emotions and everything that's going on, it's a really great trip. And I think that's where it succeeded, where it did that for me. It is one of those ones you really start to break it down. You are going to find parts where things don't hold together. Sure. But it's still such a great experience of just watching it. Mm -hmm. And that's not to completely defend criticisms against against it. Yeah. I can see why it was influential to a lot of other things. And at least some of the holes in the story, not necessarily holes, but you know what I mean? The details that are missing, 
it leaves you wanting more to the point that I am pretty curious about those sequels and the comic book spinoffs whenever we get to that to see how they yeah. followed up on those threads. Because again, it's not a film where the interesting aspect is the mythology. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of it is the characters and style. Right. And how are those sequels going to follow up on that style when they don't have this craftsman working on them? Mm -hmm. Especially when we're talking direct-to-video sequels. Yeah. Yeah. I'm keeping my expectations measured, <laughs> but we still have a little while till we get to those. Hopefully we can yeah. get a little breathing room. Right. But anyways, you know, before we move on to the box office and release, I did actually throw out a question to my followers on Twitter. I just wanted to hear a little bit more from other people because I know this is a film that has a pretty wide exposure and a wide following. Even people who scoff at Joel Schumacher usually hold up this film as one that they enjoyed. And again, we're hitting that era of Schumacher where we're hitting a lot of the nostalgia buttons of people our age. Right. So I just asked people on Twitter, so when did you first see this? How old were you? What did you think of then? What do you think of it now? And I also leave this open to other people who listen to the show. Absolutely chime in on the comments because we want to hear more about where were you when you discovered this movie? Because it was such a pop culture hit at the time. Our friend Kay O'Shea, who guessed it on The Wiz, they said they first saw it in the early 2000s. I was somewhere between 18 and 21, and I watched it with the person who introduced me to horror movies before I met Dana. It's got a lot of fond memories attached to it, and I haven't seen it since, but they were very excited to hear that it is currently on Netflix. <laughs> Sonny Allison said they first saw it whenever it would have hit HBO after being first released. Probably the late 80s, must have been, as we still had opinions on which was the best Corey. She loved it back then, and the last time she rewatched, felt it held up pretty well, but wondered why they were allowed to watch it as a kid. <laughs> right? <laughs> to be fair, you could say that about most kids' movies of the 80s. Because the 80s were a time where, let's say, the word taste hadn't quite been invented yet. Yeah. No. PG-13 was still new. You know, we oh, were yeah. figuring it out. <laughs> oh, yeah. And we got into that on DC Cab. We got into the number of Barbarians. And mm. Even Goonies was a pretty, uh, how did they get away with that at times movie? Yeah. So my friend Body Snatchers said, first horror film I fell in love with when I was 11. Wasn't allowed to see it the previous year in theaters and eagerly awaited the VHS by obsessing over the John Alvin poster art. It was the bridge <laughs> between Amblin films and the more adult genre flicks completely unable to view through any kind of adult objectivity. I love everything about it. Scripts, performances, the sets, the songs and score, cinematography, etc. That's the thing where I'm kind of glad I didn't see it until now because I could not imagine watching this film on pan and scan VHS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you'd miss out a lot of the cinematography. Yeah. And yeah. Mm -hmm. I've even got to check to see if the Netflix version is cropped a bit because this is the 235 by 1 anamorphic format where it's the wide, wide screen. Hmm. Okay. And Netflix has kind of had a bit of a reputation for cropping the edges off of that even. Mm. But again, just beautiful, beautiful photography in this movie. And I just would hate to have grown up in the VHS era and watched this. <laughs> even given all the VHS films that I love where I then since saw them on widescreen, mm -hmm. I'm like, I understand that there are people nostalgic for that format, but never again for me. <laughs> I mean, I know I must have watched it on VHS first. Yeah. Because I remember like specifically was like, oh, Alex Winter's in this. I have to, oh, I sure. have to rent this. And even if airing on TV would have been the same pan and scan. Probably, yeah. Right. I know there are some people who say these movies played better on VHS. And it's like, yes, we call those blinders. <laughs> <laughs> VHS is the beer goggles of movies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Brandy said, I think I was around 11 or 12. I didn't quite get the sexuality in it, and the garlic bathtub scene scared the crap out of me. But I unabashedly love it, even if it did give me unrealistic expectations for saxophone players. <laughs> God, yeah. Just imagine seeing that scene for the first time. Well, I did see that scene for the first time. Yeah, that was the fun thing about watching it with Melissa, was like, as the saxophone scene was coming up, I'm just like, why are you just looking at me? <laughs> He was just waiting, just waiting for that reaction. Mm -hmm. Greg Hood chimed in with, I was eight at most, loved it, still love it. Evie, our friend <laughs> Evie, who was on our St. Almost Fire episode and we'll be back again. She said, the first time I saw it, I was probably seven or eight, but I probably watched it from behind the couch because I wasn't allowed to watch quote unquote scary movies as a kid. And yeah, I thought it was scary then, traumatic Chinese food scene. <laughs> but nowadays I think it's amazing. And we didn't really get into the Chinese food scene, where it's the vampires messing with Michael and making him see things in the food. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, once again, like, what's the motivation there of like, first, it's like, okay, we're just gonna mess with this guy and scare him. And then it's like, here's the wine. Yeah. How do you go from that? But it's an interesting idea. 
And that's where, again, I think the first act could have had a little more breathing room because we do get these scenes of David testing Michael, like with the motorcycle race and then the Chinese food. And then mm-hmm. even after he's drunk in the blood, there's the whole scene where they're hanging off of the railroad tracks. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's fun. But again, we never really feel why David feels this connection. And again, mm-hmm. we don't have any of the scenes between David and Star of why her not wanting to feed on this person but bring him in is now translated to David. Right. Like I said, it also doesn't really make sense with we're told that Max wanted to create the family and bring in the boys because he knew that the mom wouldn't join without her children joining. I still have trouble like when did Max put in this plan? I only get the impression they've been there for like two or three weeks at the most by the end of the film. So when did Max decide that he wants the mom and therefore he has to have the kids? And when did David, because David meets Michael pretty early on when Michael knows the star. So like right. the whole thing doesn't quite make a whole lot of sense to me. And I'm, again, I overthink these things a little bit too much. <laughs> no, I think the first act really needed to expand out and be reconstructed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In terms of how Michael meets star and star leads to David and David to decides to make this guy a part of the clan. Mm-hmm. They did need to breathe that out more. Right. Mm-hmm. As well as things, I love where it goes from then, but we don't really have enough of an instigating motivation for why Michael was brought into this. Right. So Alexander Adrock, my old co-host at Masters of Carpentry, we do have him plan to join us here at some point on this series. He said, I was babysitting in the 90s and I found it and everything scary. Now I think the sex <laughs> scene is oddly timed and unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think the sex yeah. scene is very tastefully done, but again, it just doesn't really feel Are you like sure it. he's not talking about the sax scene? Oh. Now, if instead of a sex scene, Star had just broken out a sax. <laughs> so much I better. don't think she's got the abs for it. And he throws in some <laughs> percussion, you know. <laughs> again, I think, you know, the sex scene is, again, we don't have enough development of the Michael Star relationship. Right. No. I don't have a problem with the fact that they had sex. I just don't think that it's consummating a relationship that, again, had enough development. No, they just looked at each other a lot, basically. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Though I do also love when Michael is coming home with the walk of shame. It's like first his mom has to stop him and ask him what's going on. And then he gets into the kitchen and grandpa's like, oh, I see I'm not the only one who got lucky last mm-hmm. night. <laughs> <laughs> I love the scene where Star comes to talk to him in the bedroom. Because again, it's a great sequence between them. But then also Sam being stuck in the middle of it. And especially the whole thing of like her just rushing up to the window and Sam being like, I told you she's a vampire. <laughs> Lingwivert said, I first saw it as an older teen and didn't like it as much as I thought I would. Since then, I've learned to appreciate it as a satire of drug use. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely comparisons you can make there. Mm -hmm. The teen peer pressure, the effects that it's having. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting look at it. Yeah. Again, I think it's more just a broader metaphor of teenage disassociation. But again, you know, drug use has long been a part of that. Right. So I definitely think that's a very fair reading of the film. Bizarro Jimmy Olsen, who I know as co-host of Mystery Movie Night with my friend Michael May, he said it was 1987, I was 17, I thought it was pretty good then and now. I think our last one here is author Rosie Best, who said, Very first impression, a VHS on my dad's shelf that I was scared of. Then when I was 20-ish, watching it and falling in love with it, especially the very camp and stupid parts. I long for that kind of fun and vamp films. Dearly wish the gay had been text, but I can live with subtext. <laughs> it's a film that a lot of people discovered when it came out. A lot of people mm-hmm. discovered on VHS. I think a lot of people have discovered it just because, especially the whole 90s era of vampire films and TV shows, this was definitely a big influence on. Mm-hmm. The 70s still had a lot of vampires, but the 70s was still kind of the tail end of that classic wave of vampires because you still had the Hammer horror films going into the 70s right. a lot of the low budget ones were still just riffing on the hammer but i know like the 80s was when we got this whole new wave of let's try to modernize the vampire and see what would vampires be like in the modern day we had the hunger we had fright night we had this mm-hmm. we had near dark this whole wave of vampire media arose out of that whole modernizing of the vampire and again really exploring the dark romance of it the sensuality of it the grittier side of it you know that of course led to buffy and angel Angel. We had taking that influence, but going back to classical ways, we had interview with the vampire. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting seeing the place that Lost Boys had in that reimagining of vampire media. 
No, I think you're right. I think it absolutely influenced, like I said, Buffy and Angel and Spike and Forever Night, all these type of like mm. the tortured vampire. A lot of that comes from Anne Rice, but I think also mm. just the iconography of Kiefer as the punk vampire that lives on till today. Yeah, the style definitely had a major influence, no doubt about that. So just to get into the release of the film. So the film came out on Friday, July 31st of 1987. I believe I mentioned before, this was a very low budget movie. They had to find ways to milk the budget as best they could. I think it was just $8.5 million. I think it was originally supposed to be like a $20 million movie, but because he insisted on getting these unknown actors, because Kiefer had a bit part in a movie before he did this. This launched Kiefer. This was the movie mm -hmm. that launched Kiefer. I think he had been in Stand By Me, but I know Joel had seen him in just a bit part that he had, had in one movie where I think even most of his role had been cut out, but he had just had this brief appearance on screen and Joel was just like, get me that guy. Mm -hmm. It was just such an unknown cast. I think, honestly, the most prominent actor in this cast was Diane Weist, who had just won the Oscar. Mm -hmm. The studio just slashed the budget down because there was no big-name actor to sell the movie on. So the film was an $8 million budget. It opened on July 31st, and it came in number two because that was the same week as The Living Daylights, the latest Bond film. Okay. <laughs> and some of the other films that were already out around this time, you already had Robocop, which was in, let's see, what was it? It's third week of release. You had Superman IV, The Quest for Peace. You had Full Metal Jacket, Adventures in Babysitting, Jaws IV, The Revenge. So this was Superman IV and Jaws IV were both in theaters at this time. <laughs> wow. God, yeah. Moving into its second week of release. Lost Boys still held its position at number five. Living Daylights was still at number one. Masters of the Universe had opened at number three. <laughs> really? I would have thought that Masters of the Universe would have been lower down. I would have thought that too. I am a little surprised. <laughs> and of course, the buddy cop movie Stakeout opened at number two. Mm. This also had Who's That Girl opening at number 10. <laughs> In its third week of release... The Lost Boys had dropped to number nine. Mm. I'm kind of surprised. It did not really seem to have that big of an impact in theaters. Yeah. Mm. Yet Stakeout had finally shot up to number one. That was the big hit at the time. And opening at number seven is the Disorderlies. Oh, I'm amazed that got that high. <laughs> yeah. And opening at number 12 is Monster Squad. <laughs> so moving into its fourth week, The Lost Boys jumped up a little bit to number eight. <laughs> Stakeout is still number one. Disorderlies is shot way down. Yeah, I would think so. <laughs> <laughs> Garbage Pail Kids, the movie opened, but it's not even in the top 20. It's just like, oh, by the way, this opened. No, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> yeah. And this is when Dirty Dancing opened at number four. Oh, well, there goes that. <laughs> yeah. Plus Born in East L.A. at number two. I kept forgetting to mention La Bamba is also running throughout all this. Mm. In its fifth week of release, The Lost Boys is down to number 13. This might be the last one we mentioned. Stakeout is still number one. Dirty Dancing, surprisingly, is down still at number three. And this is when Hamburger Hill and The Fourth Protocol opened at fourth and fifth. I uh, don't really care about either one of those. Mm -mm. Never heard of that. Let's just take a look at one more week. Get six weeks. Is Lost Boys still number 13. Still holding their number 13. Stakeout number one, Dirty Dancing bumped up to number two. Just going to take a look at one more week, see if it's dropping off yet. Lost Boys still at number 13. Mm -hmm. Nothing else really new opening. Did Dirty Dancing become number one yet? Not yet. <laughs> and we finally get, I think it's seventh or eighth week by now. Mm -hmm. Lost Boys has finally dropped off, so we'll stop here. Stakeout and Dirty Dancing have dropped down to fifth and sixth, because hmm. this is the week that Fatal Attraction opened. Oh, wow. As well as Hellraiser and The Pickup Artist. Hmm. So, J.D., any guesses on how well this did at the box office? Well, I have the Wikipedia don't, page don't open, say. so I'm not going to guess. <laughs> Angie, do you have any guesses for how well this film did ultimately? I mean, I would think decently. I'm not going to guess a number because okay. I have no idea. It did $30 million. Okay. Against an $8 million budget. So it did decently enough. Yeah. Yeah. It's a profit. And then apparently when it hit video, it became a massive seller on video. I can see that. This is the era for that. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of those ones where something can just kind of breeze through theaters and then it hits video and then suddenly everyone's like, oh, oh. Mm -hmm. And this one did huge on video. And again, there was talk a couple years down the road of doing a sequel, mm -hmm. which was scripted. We will be covering it at some point. There was then talks of doing a prequel, and Joel was involved with development of both of these. 
I want to say it was Jeffrey Bohm scripted a sequel, Lost Boys 2, that Joel was in talks to do. Joel was also in talks to do a prequel movie that I think he also did the story outline for called Lost Boys The Beginning, which was scripted by Eric Red, who is the guy who wrote Near Dark. Mm. So it would have been interesting to see what the crossing of the waters was on that. I don't know, again, the details of the story. We have that script. We have the script for the sequel and the prequel. JD and Angie and I will be discussing those again later down the road. There was the whole series of direct-to-video movies following the further adventures of the Frog Brothers. There are further adventures of Lost Boys. There's a couple of comic book series. We have plans to cover that stuff a little bit later down the road, so we will be getting back to that. But any thoughts that you guys have in terms of sequels and where you would like to see them go? Even though it necessarily wouldn't make sense, I'd like to see David come back. Mm -hmm. Because he doesn't explode or anything like the others do, so you could hand wave that. Well, but once you've killed Max, does that kill him or is it because he's a full Ooh. vampire? Yeah, I think they said it's only when you're half... Because, again, I think the Maybe consummation of vampirism okay. is when you feed. Gotcha. David's already fed. But, yeah, I'd like to see more David. And, I, like I said, I want to see, did the Frog Brothers... I mean, obviously, they didn't stake a vampire before, but what did they do before? How did they get this way? Mm. I'd like to see them both before and after. I'm interested in them just because they're really fun characters. And that'll be interesting because I know the direct video sequels definitely explore that. Um, after and I mm -hmm. believe the initial comic book series is a tie into those sequels that explores their backstory. Okay. So we'll get something there. So we'll see if it's good, good or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I may be disappointed, but I may get it. <laughs> and JD, you're going to be sticking around with us through that journey. So any thoughts you have? Yeah, I kind of want to see the same things that Angie mentioned. I want to know more about how do the Frog Brothers become vampire experts, whether or not they've actually done anything with the supernatural before, or are they just talking out of their butts? <laughs> you could could have brought David back if they wanted to. I mean, he was really staked by antlers, so I don't know if that counts as right? not really a wooden stake. Yeah. If they wanted to go down that route, I don't think they're going to get Kiefer Sutherland back for the direct-to-DVD videos. <laughs> That's just a th I'm just guessing. I haven't seen them yet, so I could be wrong. I mean, I could see potentially, like, there might be a story with Michael, Star, and Laddie if they really wanted to go down that route mm -hmm. and see, like, what it's mm -hmm. like post-half-vampirism if they wanted to do that. Again, I just don't foresee that happening. Maybe in the comics. Maybe in the comics. The directed dvd stuff, I'm expecting schlock, to be honest. But it could be entertaining <laughs> schlock. We'll see when we get there. My big question is, Santa Clarita, a hubbub of broader vampire activity? Yeah. Mm. Is it literally just Max and the Lost Boys that have been causing all this vampire activity? Or is there this kind of broader underground vampire community right. that, you know, the Frog Brothers are aware of, that all these murders are happening from, that Grandpa's aware of? Because mm -hmm. I could really see a sequel where it's Sam, the Frog Brothers, and Grandpa decide to finally weed out all the vampires in Santa Clarita. Mm. Yeah. And you could have this whole thing of them basically setting up their own extermination agency. <laughs> you could dig into the deeper mythos of vampires in Santa Clarita while also trying to explore, like, who else is still here? I just want to see this world of Santa Clarita and its ties to vampirism because obviously stuff's going on. And Grandpa knows about vampires. His wife died eight years ago. Was she killed by a vampire? Is that why he doesn't like going to town anymore? Hmm. Is that why he literally avoids going to town? <laughs> There's vampires all over the place. He doesn't like vampires. Is there some kind of a history there? And him taking the Frog Brothers under his wing and them deciding, <laughs> let's just go get rid of all these freaking vampires. Let's take our operation up to the next level. <laughs> you know, we've cleaned out this brood. Let's clean out the whole town. I could see that building into an interesting storyline. Yeah. Of course, we're kind of going to get parts of that storyline, but because I had never seen this film before, I haven't read any of those scripts. I haven't seen any of those mm -hmm. movies. I haven't read any of those comics. So this mm -hmm. is all new to me. So again, we're going to be going in with fresh eyes. I'm assuming neither of you have explored any of those yet. No. no. This is all going to be new to us. It's going to be a little while till we get to those. We have plans for those on the schedule, but it's going to be a little while till we get to those down the road. Please don't spoil us. <laughs> I just asked that if you chime in on the comments of this episode, which we'd love to hear what you think about The Lost Boys, but please just save discussion of the sequels till we get to those sequels because we want to go into those fresh. So otherwise, I don't really have much else to add, but this led into Joel directing his first music video, which was In Excess is the Devil Inside. So we are going to take a little break here, a little pause in the recording where we're going to watch the music video and then we're going to share our thoughts on it. So uh, we'll be back here in, in just a minute. So we have all seen the In Excess music video Devil Inside. Yes. Yes. 
This was from their album Kick, which they had done mm-hmm. after they worked with Joel on Lost Boys. But it was through being involved on the soundtrack to Lost Boys that they asked Joel if he wanted to come and direct this music video for them. Joel had never directed a music video before. I don't know if he ever did any like commercials or anything. Because mm-hmm. I know back in the day he did design work for some commercials, did costumes and sets. But I don't know if he actually directed a music video or a commercial before. Of course, we brought up during our St. Almost Fire the wonderful classic music video for Man in Motion, mm, mm-hmm. yeah. which Joel had the idea for, but wasn't actually available to direct. <laughs> oh, man, imagine if he had. Anyways, he came in and did this music video for them. And the music video, it's a lot of abstract imagery, a lot of just nightclub imagery with a little odd bits here where people are giving mysterious looks. There's a couple dancing. There's this woman in the back of a car with a guy with sunglasses. There's odd little bits of imagery, but they don't really explain any of it. It's a lot of just very mysterious, moody, atmospheric Mm -hmm. stuff going on in this nightclub and the lead singer of the band having a devil's mask on the back of his head. So, J.D., what did you think about the song and the music video? I like the song. It's one of those 80s classics. The video feels a lot like Lost Boys. You can definitely feel the influence there, but it didn't really leave a large impact on me. It feels like a lot of the videos of that era. It's the band playing with imagery happening that's evocative to the song, but not necessarily trying to tell a story or do much more than just set the mood. I think the one sort of good thing, and I don't know if it was intentional or made to tie into the song at all, but the way that it's definitely like all of these fairly close up shots are giving you that claustrophobic feel that you can get in a crowded dance club like that. Mm -hmm. I think that was done very well. The song, you know, when you actually sit down and listen to it, you realize, man, this is really repetitive. It's like, yes, everyone has a devil inside. I get it. You know, (laughs) like lyrically, there's certainly not a whole lot there. And so I guess in that token is that yeah, this isn't really one of those music videos that has a storyline to it. You maybe get a little bit of a hint of like, oh yeah, all these people, they maybe have a little bit of a sinister side to them or something like that, but it's not really drawn out or, you know, it's mostly dancing and the band yeah. performance and so forth. Michael Hutchins is a great lead performer. He's, mm-hmm. So anytime you put a camera on him, you're going to get good stuff. So yeah, it's not an amazing video, but it's fun. I liked it. There's not much to it. But again, it's building this world. Mm -hmm. This is, again, something that I keep going back to with Joel is he does a really great job of just painting the world of the nightclub. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on. You get these little momentary hints of a story that might be happening, but then you never get to follow through on it because then you're then lost back in the crowd. And there's just all these various odd people and everything just dancing. And then all those bits where everyone just turns and stares straight at the camera. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of almost like this nightclub is bringing out the devil in people. Mm -hmm. Sinister and moody, it doesn't really go anywhere, but it's evoking an atmosphere, evoking a look and a style. And I like it. I think it's fun. It brings up again on the St. Elmo's Fire episode, I brought up Bright Lights, Big City, the film that Joel was going to direct. And that was, again, set very much in a nightclub and dealing with the chaos of the nightclub. And I think this video is actually a really interesting taste of what his film of that could have been like at times. Mm -hmm. I like it. Again, it has the allure of the nightclub and the chaos of the nightclub. Mm Mm-hmm. And there are also little touches of humor in there, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the Barbarian Brothers, right? That was the Barbarian (laughs) Brothers that we see for a minute. They have fully digivolved to their final form. (laughs) And I'm guessing this was just filmed in California. Mm. So it it wouldn't have been that hard to get him. (laughs) He knew them. Right. He sure as hell wasn't going to direct another movie for them. But but if he had, imagine if he had. (laughs) Again, we pointed out that Joel Schumacher did not come up with the school of filmmakers who gave us the music video. Mm. But do you think that this is a video that fits comfortably into the type of videos of the time? Yeah, I think this is very much of that era, which I don't think it stands out from that era that much, but I think it fits comfortably within what a lot of music videos of the time were doing. Yeah, that's why I kind of wish I had like a list of maybe like the top 10 music videos around this time for comparison's sake. I don't know that this would hold up as best of the no, best. No, no, but... no, no, no. I'm just saying like, I don't know how deep they had gotten into storytelling yet. I think Michael Jackson, probably more closer into the 90s, really brought that to becoming a thing and Madonna to some extent too. And so I think at the time, that probably was primarily just people having fun and brand playing and that kind of... So it certainly fits in very well. I think he learned enough that this is not like a awkwardly done or standout kind of thing for the time, right. for sure. Yeah. Music videos usually have like three types. You have the short film music video where it's more of the narrative mm-hmm. style. 
you have the complete abstract music video where it's let's just do something weird. Mm -hmm. And then you have the ones which are pretty common and typical where it's here's shots of the band, here's something else going on. Right. Those I do find the least interesting and the least exciting because it's just shots of the band and here's other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. This one, it still at least has that kind of allure to me of just capturing the feel of what it's like to go to a nightclub. Yeah. Of you just kind of get lost in this crowd of odd people, these moments that you're glimpsing, but you don't get anything anything else going on. The only thing is we're not really following a person through that. Right. Yeah. You're just getting shots. But I don't know that you really need to because everyone's looking straight at the camera. We are that person. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't think it's like brilliant or inventive or revolutionary. It's just, it's a perfectly fine music video for a decent song. And it's a good song. Mm -hmm. It is repetitive. When I said, hey, let's take five minutes to watch the video, I didn't realize the <laughs> song is five full minutes of him right. just going, devil inside the devil inside. Yep. <laughs> mm hmm I don't think we have more music videos directed by Joel until we get up to the Batman movies. Okay. Angie, do you think that Joel could have had a broader career in music videos had he been interested in it? I definitely think so. I think just looking at the scenes in The Lost Boys, like I think if he would have gone for something a little bit more narrative in general, mm -hmm. I think he definitely could have pulled those kind of videos off for sure. Even just that concept of, you know, going to the nightclub and it brings out the devil in you. You could build just mm -hmm. an interesting story around that idea, but we don't really get that. Right. It's more just kind of a button. Yeah. But no, I think if he wanted to and if there was interest, I think he could have made more yeah. and they could have been a little bit stronger, perhaps, than this one. Right. I mean, especially if you look at all the music videos that are centered around design aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Joel excels at design aesthetic. Yeah. I think he could have had fun where it's in an environment where you just go wild. Right. And I mean, I do think it was a very small detail, but just like you had the one girl who was in the black dress and then the other one in the white dress mm -hmm. shows up. It's like almost the same exact dress. Like, I think there's a little bit there, but just not enough. And you have to wonder how much of this was constructed constructed and how much of it was he just kind of went and just found moments right and just edited it together hey everybody nolan and angie here we're just jumping in for an extra segment on this episode we had already finished this episode i was already almost done cutting it and i was looking around through the music videos that were associated with the soundtrack just to throw stuff in the show notes and I found out we kind of missed a few things. Oops. <laughs> yeah. So we talked about how In Excess was Joel Schumacher's first music video. It was not. <laughs> uh, no, we didn't say that. No, we right. just said it was one of. <laughs> well, part of it is, is the music video databases that are online are kind of incomplete. Sure. So there's two specific music videos that we also wanted to just cover for this episode. Those are Lou Graham's Lost in the Shadows, which I watched it and then it like popped up the credit directed by Joel yeah. Schumacher. And I was like, yep. oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another one. It's the band Mummy Calls, the song Beauty Has Her Way, which I cannot find any info on who right. directed that. There's no credit on the video. There's no info on that video at all on any of the music video databases online. I couldn't find anything on who did or didn't direct it. Mm -hmm. But I think it looks a lot like the same type of style. I'm going to argue the opposite, but we'll get there. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's <laughs> I'm thinking it might be directed by Joel, but I, I guess we'll discuss. We don't know for sure, yeah. basically. So, yeah. But we'll at least bring that one up. Mm -hmm. And I did look through. There were a couple of others, like the song Good Times by In Excess and Jimmy Barnes had a music video, but that's because that was already an existing song song. Mm -hmm. And then I want to say it was Eddie and the Tide with their song Power Play also had a video where it was okay. mostly just montage of the movie with just a couple shots of the band. Mm. I didn't really think there was much there to discuss. Sure. Biggest surprise, there was never a music video for Cry Little Sister. Yeah, that is very surprising. Especially given its ties to this movie. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm wondering if they thought Lost in the Shadows would be the big song associated with this movie. <laughs> I, uh, maybe? I don't maybe. know. <laughs> Because <laughs> Cry Little Sister is definitely the one that's played the more. I mean, could you imagine right. like, you know, as David is dying and bathed in light, like Lost in the Shadows kicks in. And <laughs> no, I mean, maybe, that, like, maybe that's the, love the thing. the scene, maybe, Lost in the Shadows. <laughs> maybe he thinks of Cry Little Sister like the whole movie is one big long music video yes. for it. So you don't need to do another one. Oh, yeah. You don't need to. Yeah. <laughs> Just watch the movie again. <laughs> it literally starts and ends with Cry Little Sister. Yep, exactly. It's a very yeah. extended cut scene in the middle of the song. <laughs> And the biggest disappointment for me mm -hmm. is that nobody did a music video for Tim Capello's I Still Believe. Oh. I mean, it's like you're <laughs> filming the sax man on stage. They had to have filmed right. him doing the entire song. Just put it out. <laughs> entire video of that. Mm -mm -mm. So anyways, let's go ahead and talk about Lost in the Shadows by Lou Graham. So just kind of in general, what do you think of that song? 
I'm curious why Lou Graham, I don't know, maybe he got into a fight with the other guys in Foreigner. Like, this is pretty darn close to a Foreigner song. I mean, maybe it's his voice is so distinctive that you automatically go there. Mm. Like, why is this solo and not the whole group? But it's okay for what it is. I don't hate it. Don't love it. It's kind of typical 80s hair Mm -hmm. rock pop type thing. It's catchy, but there's not any particular depth to it. Right. And what was kind of funny was, you know, we were talking about the St. Elmo's Fireman emotion song, how they just took this completely unrelated song and just changed one of the lines to St. Elmo's Fire. Mm -hmm. I love how they literally just took this song and without even changing any of the lyrics, they just have someone whisper, Lost Boys, a couple of times. (laughs) Right. It's not even part of the lyrics. It's yeah. like the chorus ends and then he just says, Lost Boys. Uh-huh. Doesn't have anything to do with it. I think there is like a high pitched vocal kind of going, Lost Boys, after Lost in the Shadows, too. Yeah. So. <laughs> but it was just interesting the marketing hook of how they did right. the same thing that Sam. Hey, was it's like. got the word Lost in it. Use it. Use it. Yeah. It sounds vaguely vampiric. Right, right. And then we get to the music video where it's a lot of red and blue lighting, Mm -hmm. a lot of people, pretty sure they're vampires struggling in, I want to say it's a train car. Well, that's the thing is, are they just in a giant crate? Is it supposed to be a train, but then we never see? Yeah, I can't tell if it's like on a semi truck or if it's on a train. It feels like it's in moving. I guess... I guess it was like, we don't really have the budget for that. So let's just build this claustrophobic little set and use your imagination. And it's just kind of people like emotingly, dancingly, (laughs) depressed and lost, like lost in the shadows. Right. (laughs) But great hair and great makeup. Yeah. And Lou Graham is kind of intensely (laughs) walking through it with his hair. And little Laddie is sitting in a corner. (laughs) Right, right. And again, there's no real story to it. It's more just kind of mood piece. And then it, of Mm -hmm. course, intercuts with the movie. What did you think of the video? I'm going to change his name to Lou Ham because (laughs) he's kind of hamming it up a little bit in his close-up Well, it is Joel. But no, it fits very well. I think the movie scenes and what they shot, they flow together very well and they fit the mood and it's a good song for the movie and it works. It's a good music video overall. Yeah, no, I think it's basically just like a melodramatic mood piece, Mm -hmm. but I think it actually works kind of well. I never quite get the sense of, is Lou Graham kind of a Michael style figure or a David style figure? Because he seems to (laughs) kind of be at the center of everything, but he doesn't seem happy. Right. I would say more Michael, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. And again, it's like you have the longing things where what's kind of interesting about the crates is there is a lot of shadow play, but there's also the bright Mm -hmm. lights on the other side. So you get these slats of lights that it's like they're hiding from the light, but also longingly looking out at it Yeah. while dancing. Right. Of course. And then like Laddie doesn't do anything. It's just the actor just kind of sitting there. And then like Lou Graham like picks him up at one point. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. I don't know what was going on with that. Look, he's still here. Right. He's got this like dead stare for like most of it. It's very bizarre. I mean, if it was like this kind of story of almost like him chasing Laddie through this group of people in this closed space. Right. That could be interesting. Or if Laddie was chasing him. Mm -hmm. I could just imagine Joel. Now chase him. Chase him. (laughs) Now let's shake it up. Now you chase him. Okay, we're going to switch sides. It's just all about emoting. Ladies dance. Smoke machines. (laughs) Lots of wind. (laughs) What do you think about it just from a visual design standpoint? I'm not crazy about the crate. I guess because like the brightness and the darkness, it's a little too much. Like I want it to be a little bit darker and moodier. But like I love the hair. I love the costumes, the makeup. It's a fun late 80s Mm -hmm. gothic moody look. I like the style, but it is a bit much. I mean, because there's so Mm -hmm. much going on. You have the dancers, you have the wind, the lights, the blue and reds. And it's like, there's so much good. This more than anything else we've seen before feels like a predecessor to the Batman movies. Mm, I get, I mean, yeah, yeah. Very excessive. Right, sure. I'm not entirely saying that in a bad way. Mm -hmm. And again, I'll be curious to revisit the Batman movies, but it also kind of reminds me of the little bits that I've seen of Phantom of the Opera. Mm, Okay. And we'll be getting to it later. There's a commercial that he did just a few years ago, which was very grandiose, very gaudy and like intentionally gaudy and tacky, Mm -hmm. which is actually a still from that is what I use as the wallpaper for our website. Mm. It's interesting seeing him do something. It's almost operatic. Yeah. 
what was also interesting was, I mean, because, you know, Lost Boys, it's pretty much all boys and then you get Star. It was interesting mm-hmm. that most of these dancing figures kind of in vampiric looks, you even have the one in the kind of morning veil, are mostly women and then there's a black man. Yeah. They did like something exactly the opposite of the makeup <laughs> of the Lost Boys. Right. And it's probably also a degree of like when you're casting dancers for a music video, you're probably going to get your more share of different people. Mm -hmm. To me, it's I guess because you're getting all of the clips of like all the guys and everything like it certainly doesn't like contrast or anything like that. They just all fit together in the mood, I think. There's ways in which it feels different from the movie, Mm -hmm. but almost in a way of like they might be in the same world as the movie. Right, right. Definitely. But these are different people in a different story. Yeah. Yeah. It's our debut of Lost Boys EU, (laughs) I guess. Sure. (laughs) I mean, I guess it depends on if that is actually Laddie. Yeah, maybe his backstory is he ran into a bunch of vampires while running away and hiding on a train. And then the sun came up and they all freaked out. Mm -mm. And that one guy just started pensively singing. (laughs) And just throwing Lost Boys at the end of chorus for some reason. Laddie can never figure it out. See, that should have been the perfect time for Laddie to make his escape because they were so focused on singing and dancing. He could have just snuck right out. It's like right as they get to the end of the chorus, he should have just pointed and said, Lost Boys. That's like as everyone goes and looks, he just slips through the slats. Mm Mm-mm. So then that brings us to Mummy Call's song, Beauty Has Her Way. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll be curious, what is your stance in terms of do you think this might be a Joel video or not? There are certain things in terms of the design of the sets and the costumes and so forth that I can see a similarity, but I kind of feel like it may just be the aesthetic of the time period. Because when you look at both Lost in the Shadows and Devil Inside, you see a lot of great sweeping movement Mm -hmm. to the whole thing. Whereas like this one was like a whole bunch of really still shots of people in a club and the lead singer just wandering back and forth and talking to the different women and interacting with them. It just didn't have the same... It wasn't as theatrical. Right. You know, emotion and style that we've seen in the other videos so far, which at least led me to believe, eh, I don't think this is him. See, whereas to me, knowing Joel, I don't think he would want to pigeonhole himself with a style. Mm -hmm, Sure. And it's a very different song. It's a very quiet, moody song. Whereas, you know, Devil Inside is a very intense song. Lost in the Shadows is a very over-the-top song. Mm -hmm. This is just kind of a very moody more somber piece and it wasn't just the design aesthetic and the fact that Mm -hmm. it again also used a lot of the blue and red gels but also just the ways in which it was shot i thought it was very nicely shot in terms of the bit when he walks over to them and sings to them like the close-up on him there's this intensity to the way it's shot that i thought reminded me of some of the scenes in even like cousins or lost boys Mm -hmm. plus it has a saxophone solo (laughs) that's just the time period he's made two (laughs) movies now that had featured saxophone solos that's not just the time period No, but the late 80s, man, that was like when saxophone was a big thing. And that's the other thing is this song actually did come out like a year before. It just only became popular once they put it on the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. So it's possible they filmed this video back in 86. That's the other thing. The fact that it has no Lost Boys connections at all, no clips, no nothing. Since the movie was gaining popularity, you would think you would want to cash in on that and build the association. It could be. I mean, it might also just be like a label thing. It might also just be that they didn't want to. It might also be that they just kind of had their own idea for a story here. And and this one, it is a little bit more of an actual sequence. It's basically the singer is going around singing to all these women, all of whom are incredibly unimpressed by him. Right. And then he gets this one woman to briefly dance with him, and then she returns to her partner. And I think the other thing, it's a very queer video. It's a lot of women paired with women, women dancing together, women dining together. It's almost as though him and the other band are the only men in the club of women. Uh, Yeah, I just still say that may just have something to do with the time period. Androgyny was really huge at that point. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly what the one lady in the suit that's dancing Mm -hmm. with the girl that danced with him. Like, it's possible. Like, I'm not saying absolutely it's definitely not him. To me, I didn't get the feel of it as much as I did compared to watching the other videos. Yeah. I mean, at least this one didn't have the Barbarian Brothers show up for a shot. (laughs) (laughs) Might have made it better. I don't know. (laughs) Hey, what if they were the beauty having her way? I also didn't really like the song. Yeah, it's a weird song. Yeah, I mean, I like a lot of slow and moody 80s stuff, but this was just a little... 
I've heard better versions of this. I see everything you do. I know everything you know. It's like, I don't know if those parts are like singing from the perspective of the beauty or if they're singing about the beauty. It's a weird song. Right. It's a very 80s emo song. Yeah. yeah. And the singer with his giant, you know, shock hair and mm-hmm. and intensity. It's very fitting of that. The bassist did kind of look like Benedict Cumberbatch, and that <laughs> kind of got my attention for a moment, but you know. <laughs> but I mean, come on, the saxophone solo was even against a hall of mirrors. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, oh, that, see, now you're saying that you're reminding me. Yeah, see, that's my other argument. I don't think Joel would do that. I think he that would. That was so ridiculous. <laughs> I think he knows that that's not a good shot. I thought it was a great shot. <laughs> oh, it was ridiculous. <laughs> it was so silly. I don't know. I, there's something just about the style and the mood and the atmosphere and the way in which this is shot and filmed. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of the way that Joel will build a scene. But again, it's, I can't confirm that it is. Right. Can't confirm that it isn't. So it's one of those things where it's just kind of up in the air. And if anyone knows any more info about, you don't hear many people talk about the band Mummy Calls these days. No, no. I don't know that there's that much info out there, but if anyone knows whether yay or nay, is this a Joel music video? I don't know. Yeah, please let us know. Yeah. But I mean, hey, I think Lost in the Shadows was still interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And as far as I know, that is his first music video. Okay. Unless, you know, I'll I'll be watching some best of the 80s and like (laughs) another music video will come on. I'll just be like, oh, fuck. (laughs) (laughs) I strongly doubt he did that Irene Cara DC Cab music video. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. Well, we know he didn't do Man in Motion. Mm -hmm. That was Falkenberg the (laughs) third. But I also know he probably did not do... There was a music video just for the piano theme. Oh, for St. Elmo's Fire? Of St. Elmo's Fire. They literally did a music video to promote the the piano theme. And it's literally a couple on a beach with a horse. Oh, I think I've seen that. It's terrible. Yeah. (laughs) You'd think they would have just used clips from the movie. You'd think. But even the movie didn't fit that music half the time. (laughs) No, it didn't. But still... It's called the theme from St. Elmo's Fire. Yeah, it'll just be playing entirely under a montage of Kirby stalking. (laughs) I mean, I'm just saying somebody saw that music video and said, St. Elmo's Fire is about a couple and a horse? Weird. (laughs) Well, I mean, just kind of moving forward, though, I think I'm definitely going to start looking into the soundtracks more of the movies before we actually record the episodes. See if they're hidden anywhere. Because even if they're not going to have any directed by Joel, and as far as I know, we're not going to have many more till Mm -hmm. the Batmans. Right. What was also just interesting is his approach to this movie in terms of building a soundtrack around it. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be curious to see how he continues to approach that in terms of soundtracks for his films. I mean, it was certainly the era where music videos were seen as another way to help promote Mm -hmm. your film. So it makes sense. Yeah. And again, even like when we get to the Batmans, it's like it had one of the best selling soundtracks, four songs of which actually appear in the movie. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, look, I listened to those CDs repeatedly. Yeah. Both films. Yeah. Even though I didn't even like Batman and Robin, I still listened to the Batman and Robin soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. So anything else you want to throw in here? Did you want to mention the I Still Believe? Well, you know, I will go ahead and mention, if you guys enjoyed Saxophone Man, (laughs) there is someone who went and cut together a bunch of footage of him over his song, I Still Believe. It's a really nice fan video. It's cheesy (laughs) as hell. Oh, yes. Oh, I've actually looked even more into Tim Capello. I found an interview with him recently (laughs) where he gets into his bodybuilding. And Mm. what's funny is he sounds exactly like Henry Winkler. Interesting. I mean, he's still this big blonde stud, but he's just like, yeah, man, I was really excited about my music and just really developed. Developing my arms and yeah, man, I really believe in all this. You know, he's the sweetest guy. Wow. <laughs> There's some fun stuff of him out there. You can actually buy his first solo album, which just came out last year, from his personal website for fifteen dollars. Everyone will be signed. Well, there you go. <laughs> and you can even buy a Saxman pin. <laughs> Tim Capello is someone who is worth remembering. Yes, yes. So otherwise, yeah, I got nothing else to add. So I guess we'll just <laughs> throw it back to the original recording here to end the episode. Yes. I think we're done with the Lost Boys for now. Though, as we know, they won't stay lost. So anyways, JD, thank you for joining us once again. Thank you for having me, Noel and Angie. Yes, thank you for coming. And good night, Angie. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A 
cast.blogspot.com. Shimacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Hold on. What did you do? (laughs) Fire is fun.